Okay, good. Um, yeah, then uh, welcome to our uh, topic, to the calculation of the kullback leibler divergence on a genomic scale. Um, I'm Vincent, next to me here is Tim. And um, yeah, we just, let's just uh, directly uh, jump in without further further um, things. How can I? How can I? Uh, ah, you know, now it works. Okay, so. Um, um, I'll give you a, a short overview of uh, what we are talking to you um, today. So I start with an introduction with some um, biological background that you have to know a little bit, and because otherwise it would not make sense for you to listen to our presentation. Um, but I will keep this really short as an, as an excourse. Um, then we will present you one and a half sequential approaches. Um, and then, of course, um, two parallel approaches um, that are kind of uh, that kind of go in the same direction, but with a very different different focus, um, and of course, therefore, very different results in the end with, uh, regarding um, regarding performance uh, speed up and so on. And of course, as it is always in uh, presentations like this, um, we finalize with this with the conclusion of our topic. So, um, what was the motivation about uh, of our topic and what is our topic? Um, I guess no one of you have heard about the kullback leitner divergence before uh, this talk. Um, and uh, what we did is we saw this um, list with bioinformatics on this uh, this topic bioinformatics on this list of topics. So and because uh, Tim is, uh, has a bioinformatic background and I have worked in a bioinformatics company, we said, yeah, let's do something in this direction. And um, so we just went to the working group of Professor Weisbart um, from the medical bioinformatics and asked there if they have a topic maybe um, that we could do um, for the seminar that in the best case even has something, some, some output that people can use so that it's not only an educational project. Um, this was important for us. And they said, yes, it would be very cool if you could do this topic. It's kind of a standard topic in the, in the, in the uh, medical bioinformatics, um, but they have never done it on a level like with, with parallelization, and um, they wanted to know more about the resources that uh, that, is, that that you can utilize with GVDG and so on. So uh, we were very happy to lend a hand there, and um, yeah, we dive, we just dived into this topic um, and into the biological background of this. So um, of course, in this, it's as I said, an excourse. So um, yeah, we keep it simple. Um, so in cells. We have a lot of different cells and they can uh, build different proteins. And um, this creation of a protein um, is like a workflow with different stages. And um, one of the stages is a transcription of DNA to mRNA. And this is the step that we look, uh, that we look here in detail. And um, this, um, this um, transcription is regulated by so-called so transcription factors um, that bind to the DNA. And the goal is of this um, calculation here to find those places in our DNA where the transcription factors will bind with the highest chance. Um, and um, what is the genome? I guess everyone has heard of this um, uh, before. So it's like the blueprint of the body. It, is all the, um, it has all the information that we are built of. Um, it's encoded in the DNA. There we have 3.1 billion base pairs. Um, a basis can be A, T, C, and G. This is uh, the shortages for the longer names. And in every cell, just so that you can have an imagination, in every cell that you have is two meters of DNA. And you can imagine how many cells you have. And um, this, I think this is really a um, very cool thing. Um, our DNA is organized in 23 or for male in 24 um, different chromosomes. Um, and in every, in every um, chromosome, is in every in every chromosome we have uh, now in every cell we have two chromosomes the one from 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 the father and from the mother and for us now that we come back to the information technology this um, DNA was um, like formatted in a 3.5 gigabyte byte raw text file um, that can be downloaded on this website that we've linked there and um, what we need. To calculate this are the so-called position weight matrices, the PVMs. You will hear a lot of them during the next half an hour. Um, these are the probability of the basis um, on, at, the, at the positions, um, how possible it is that they, that they will bind at this specific position in our long DNA, um, DNA sequence. 
So it has four rows here. Again, we have the A, T, G, and C. Um, and here encoded are the chances that uh, something will bind at this position. So here, for example, um, at the position one, it will bind with a 50-50 chance at G or at C. And in total, we have 1,900 of those matrices. Um, this can be, um, they can have five columns like we have, uh, or we have five columns like we have here, but they can have up to 35 column columns. And there in total, we have 24,391 positions. Um, again, in the text file, when you originally download it, that has the size of 750 kilobytes. Um, and now this was a little bit biological background. Now the mathematical background is the kohlberg leibniz divergence. Um, I will not deep dive into this. If you are interested in the mathematics, then you have to read our, uh, we have to read our, um, our, our um, report. Um, but in general, this is the formula that uses the, um, the DNA and the position and the, um, and the uh, matrix as an input and calculates the chance of a binding at this specific point. Um, and now let's bring this all together. Um, this is in general what our algorithm will do. You will see here in the sketch, you will see three, um, three loops in this algorithm. So we start with this transcription factor at this position here, and then we do the calculation. This is where the kohlberg leibniz divergence is calculated, and then we write back the first result. Then we go one position to the next side, to then we go a position further and use the same matrix again and calculate the result for this. And again and again and again. And so we really calculate this through. And when we are done with the first matrix, we go back to the beginning and start with the second matrix. And as a reminder, we have 1,600, 900, whatever of this. So we will do this quite a lot of time. And um, therefore, of course, we write an algorithm. Um, and what we used, we did it in Python. I want to do it in .NET from the beginning, but he won, so we did it in Python. Um, we used MPI for Pi for the MPI bindings. Um, we replaced C Python um, with um, with number. That what will, what is this? You will see uh, in the you know, think four or five slides. Um, this whole setup was done with Spark and executed via Slurm. And we come now to the first implementation, the sequential one. That yes, I had over. So this is um, basically our prototype, and the workflow is pretty straightforward. So we have our genomes that we read in and prepare. We have the PWMs that you saw a minute ago uh, that we have to actually build because we get it in a different format. And uh, then we calculate the results and write them back and so on. Yeah. So this is actually the calculation we are doing. And this won't change in uh, do it when we do this pa in parallel because this is just uh, like what we actually do. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. We have our function header, then something where we can store the results uh, later. Then we loop over the whole sequence, like Vince showed in the um, sketch. And uh, then we lo loop over our small PWM. And at each position, we calculate some something um, and sum it up to get our kuhlberg leibler divergence. And then we store that back in the respective position of our results uh, array and that's it and as you can see we looped two times so this is in quadratic runtime um, so we have uh, the length of the genome times the length of the pwm mm, yeah so now of course we wanted to see how fast are we with our uh, prototype uh, and we measured for the whole genome and just the first PWM in our file, which had length six, uh, and we ran it on my local machine. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, it took quite a while. So the uh, thing ran for eight hours. Um, and we can see that 89% of the time uh, were used by the calculations. And um, yeah, the rest of the time is yeah, basically <laughs> not relevant. Mm. What was a bummer is that we needed about 20 gigabytes of memory. So my system just has 16. So this started swapping a lot and uh, probably was slower than it should be. Um, if we take those eight hours and um, take into consideration how many uh, 
places all of our PVMs have, um, we get to an estimated runtime of 3.7 years if we would do this in this unoptimized prototype way, which of course is not feasible. And so we have to uh, do this, uh, optimize this a bit. Um, we can see here that Python, Python is relatively slow. Mm. And so this is a good example, a uh, good starting point for optimization. Um, and yeah, so we, we decided to optimize the sequential part before we went on for parallelization. This is why we said we have one and a half um, sequential uh, approaches. So th um, what we did is we added two lines to all of our code. Yeah, this is the only thing we changed. We imported number with which is a just-in-time compiler. Uh, and this is a decorator in Python. So uh, this belongs to the function here. And number is now doing something with our function. We have a look now what it does. Uh, number uh, compiles the function to LLVM. So this is in some parts like, I don't know, like Julia or something like that. Um, so this is much faster than Python after this. And um, Number can not just do this, but uh, can do a few other th things too. Um, we can parallelize small snippets of code like we would do with OpenMP, for example. Uh, also, it can do like unordered execution and uh, it actually can do uh, calculate with GPUs if you're using CUDA. Um, so this of course would be a further step to optimize code later also with for parallel with the parallelized code, um, but first we went ahead and started in implementing things with MPI. So now the question is, how long will it take? Uh, how much can we shave off using number? Maybe you can think of this right in the chat if you want. Um, what do you think? Will we end up in in which dimension will we end up? The basic were eight hours. Yes. Last time we, it took eight hours. A hey, one minute. I think there was an accident. <laughs> okay. More guesses? Okay, then let's see. Let's see. So it took eight minutes. Yeah. And uh, the calculation actually just took two minutes, where we had eight hours before. So uh, this is really good and was way better than we expected. We still have our memory problem here, but we already achieved like a speed up of uh, around 60. Um, and if we would calculate, uh, like um, scale it up, this would take around 14 days to calculate all PWMs. Yeah? Um, however, we wanted to measure this also on the server. Um, and here, it was a bit surprising how much slower the server was than the normal PC. I thought, okay, reading and writing from disk will be slower because uh, with the M2 SSD directly on the uh, motherboard, this is obviously faster, but um, we uh, took, it took 87% uh, 80, more time uh, and especially also calculation was slower. Yeah? Yes, but all overall, uh, great success. So um, it took eight minutes to calculate one PVM for the whole genome. Um, and uh, we could uh, get it down from 3.7 years for all PWMs to 14 days. Um, further improvements, of course, are, are possible, but we will go to parallel now, now and Vince will yes. take it. Yes, uh, because uh, this whole is about parallelization, this whole course. So uh, let's go uh, parallel. So uh, our first parallel approach, before I go into detail there, let's just briefly uh, talk about task and data parallel parallelity. Um, we discussed both. Um, it would have been possible to do a task parallelization as well. And later on, very later on, we also included it. But our main focus was on data parallelity. Why? Um, when you remember this uh, workflow that um, Tim presented you in the beginning, we had two preparation tasks and one calculation part. Um, and the, um, the two preparations, they could, they could be done parallel. Um, but the um, main part, the calculation, um, yeah, would need both of them. So um, 
um, yeah, there would be maybe waiting time, and um, but the data is completely independent from each other. So um, yeah, we just started with the data parallelity um, in our first approach. Our first approach, um, or in general, we wanted to that we have um, a dynamic amount of workers, so that we can that we are not bound to like four or that we have a limit, whatever. Um, in the best case, that even during the run times, the workers can change. Um, and uh, we split up our data on the chromosome level in the beginning, um, so that we can then later start working not always with the whole genome, that we start working with chromosomes, of course, the big chromosomes first, um, so that we don't have to wait for a very big chromosome in the end. Um, and uh, the scalability for this is the number of PWMs multiplies with the amount of chromosomes, um, so the maximum would be about 45,000 processes. And um, of course, there could be even more improvement potential when we split up the chromosomes. You remember they have different sizes. This is, of course, not optimal, uh, but we thought for now uh, 46,000 or 47, nearly 47,000 processes will be enough for the beginning. Um, so um, then our first approach, there we made a focus on the communication. Um, there we really want to do a lot of MPI um, because yeah, we just wanted to learn how MPI works. And um, so um, we said, OK, it's not that big of a deal to get the best possible performance in this approach, um, but let's do really some communication uh, over some uh, over some different different um, processes. Um, so um, our main process will split the work into packages. Um, they are then sent to the different workers. Um, the workers calculate something there and send some results back, and the main can then write them down. Um, this was the general idea. Um, when we have a little bit more detail um, in this approach, then you see, um, you see, yeah, you can see from, sorry, from this sketch. Um, so first we prepare the data, um, then we split them up into the different chromosomes, um, then we broadcast, uh, we broadcast them around. Um, so the uh, we broadcast the, um, the gene type, the genes ar around, um, and when the workers are ready. Um, they can then say they can just send their idle state, and when they send the idle state, then they get the next transi trans transition factor, and um, this factor and the chromosome name so are then sent back to the worker from the main, so the main is organizing this, and um, now it has you now that our workers have the chromosome already from here. Here they get the information. Uh, where they should work on, then they can do the calculation. During the calculation, of course, they are busy. Um, and when they are done, then two things happen. They send back the results, and they set, reset themselves to idle, saying that they are ready again, so they can get the next amount of work to do. And at the same time, the um, main can yeah just write down the results uh, in a file and then in the end when all stay when all um, workers are idle and there's no chromosome and no transaction transition factor left then we are done with our calculation um here you see some measurement some measurements um you see that we have a very linear uh, that we have a very lim linear um speed up here in the beginning especially when you look from four workers to eight workers that this nearly stayed uh, state uh, on a linear scale, um, but where we were very very happy, we thought like, hey, we did something very very good. Um, but of course, uh, this approach has some problems. Um, so let's review it. It's a, as I said, very good scalability, but the memory consumption is really a very big problem here. Um, every worker has the whole genome, um, and the and the main is holding all the memory. It's, it's, hold, it's holding all the results. So um, it really, uh, yeah, I will go back to 626. Here we go. No problem. Um, so um, yeah, we the reason why we don't have really more results than this is just because it was not possible to execute it anymore. Um, where we really came back, yeah, it would be, but it would not really not make sense. Um, where we really came back to the ground again. And also what you see there was without writing the results. We have this bottleneck that the main is writing all the results. And uh, well, we, one time we killed, the, uh, we killed the job with the four workers after like 20 minutes. 
be uh, where it was just busy writing results. Um, and again, this was only done for one PWM, not for like 1,400, 1,940 or something like this. Um, so in the end, it was very, very good for education. We really learned how to work with, uh, how to work with this, um, yeah, how to work with the communication and so on. Um, but we cannot consider this as a really working solution. But of course, we are programmers and we want to do something working. So let's continue with our second yes. approach. So here, of course, our focus was then to um, solve this memory usage problem and uh, to increase performance would be nice too. So uh, our idea was that the worker reads in our chromosome data and just if it needs to, and we try that this doesn't happen often, right? Um, then the worker can also write back the results on its own so that the main uh, process just has to manage the workers and it tries to do so um, in a way that uh, we minimize uh, the amount of read time. So a worker tries, it will work on its chromosome um, with all the PWMs um, and if, it, if there is no work on that chromosome left, then it will get a new chromosome, but we won't jump around here. Okay, so how does this work now? So we prepare our data like before, then we split the data, like the genome, into uh, text files containing the chromosomes, like one file per chromosome. Then we generate all the tasks. We have to uh, broadcast the background probability, but this is just five numbers, so it's not a lot of communication here. And then um, every time the worker is idle, it says I'm idle and uh, the main will uh, get the perfect job for this worker and um, it will transfer the actual transcription factor. So this is then a NumPy array and just the chromosome name and the um, worker here will read in the chromosome file if it's not present. Yeah, and um, this is pickled then if it's not already pickled so that when um, the next worker comes around and has to work on that chromosome, it's faster. Then it cal calculates uh, and write back the results um, and set the idle state again and so on. So now <clears throat> we measured this with uh, one PWM um, and yeah, so this is are the speeds. Um, we, with one worker and the whole genome, we took now one hour. And so this is uh, slower than our sequential approach before, but if uh, you pump it up here, uh, you can get faster than the sequential approach, of course. Mm. And if we have a look at our speed up curve, we can see this is not optimal. Um, even if this is a problem that in theory should be like embarrassingly parallel, so this should be there. Um, so what is the reason for this? We think that our data set is too small for the large number of workers because this just calculates like uh, 24 tasks, right, with one PWM. And uh, yeah, so the longest chromosome is limiting us um, and therefore we can't get faster than here. Um, yeah, but this shouldn't be a problem with more PWMs. Uh, so we took four PWMs and this is actually six times more data because uh, PWMs aren't all the same length. Um, our PWM from before had length six and now we are at 36. Um, and uh, we took this and we, we, we divided this by the length of the PWM to be able to compare the two different modes. Mm. And if we do so, uh, we can see that the orange line is more efficient for a higher number of workers um, because we aren't limited anymore. Um, however, still four PWMs is probably not enough to get really performant uh, results here. Um, yeah, uh, and of course, like this is something weird going on there. 
and we saw that here then again because if we take the speed up uh, of the for pwm uh, we get unexpected behavior this is uh, better than optimal so something's uh, weird there um, and our thought is that uh, with one worker here it just was too slow so that the speed up later um, uh, was better than it should be and uh, one reason for this could be that we this was the only measurement that we took overnight so maybe something was going on on the server we don't know uh, so we will ha have to repeat this measurement for the report later on yes so where can we improve even more um, of course uh, you probably noticed we didn't do a lot of profiling due to time reasons. Uh, we should have a look into this. Um, then we could increase the granularity so that we can uh, spread the data more evenly between the workers. And we don't have to uh, go for such large amounts of data to um, profile our, um, our application here. Um, and uh, shared memory multiprocessing would be a nice feature. Uh, one could do this with Numba um, or multiprocessing in Python. Uh, also, Numba has a few other things up his sleeve that I hinted at before. And one interesting other thing is the two-bit format, because if you remember, we just have those four different bases. So, so it's like four, and you can encode four into two bits. Uh, and right now we are using NumPy arrays uh, with the minimal amount of uh, integer, uh, in minimal integer size, which is somewhere, I think, eight. So uh, this would reduce IO and calculation times by probably quite a lot. And also uh, it's probably very good for memory. So this would be very interesting to look into this. Um, yeah. Okay, now. Yeah, let's now come to a conclusion of this. Um, time's almost up. So, um, what did we produce? We produced three or three and a half, uh, four or three and a half, depends a little bit how you want to see it, of different solutions that really performed different, even though the results in the end were all the same. Um, so the written results, of course, not the um, like the performance, um, and they will be returned in a very um, in a, with lots of comments and so on to the bioinformatics department, so that they can use it as a as a yeah reference to when they want to do something similar. Um, and if you are interested, I don't know, then you can, of course, feel free to email us, then you get the GitLab uh, as well. Um, and um, yeah, then we just want to share some thoughts with you as well in the end. Um, so yes, we were able to make the implementation much faster. In the original, we had like the dream to make it the whole genome possible One minute. in five minutes, five minutes, exactly. Oh, okay. This is still not, Possible, but maybe uh, until we have to hand in the report, there will be some uh, something coming in. But I don't think so. Um, then we spent a lot of time optimizing the EO. That was, and it's still not perfect, as you said. Um, there we maybe could have saved some time um, because now the benchmarking, as you see, fell a little bit short. Uh, we were just too busy programming. Um, so, uh, but even though the time management could have been better a little bit. It, uh, it was a very fun project. Uh, we, prepped, we did a lot, of, lot in pair programming. Um, mm. Maybe splitting up would have been faster, but no. Um, but on the other hand, maybe we have higher quality now because four eyes mean more than two. Um, so here would be, um, here would I would ask you for, for your uh, thoughts about this um, or other fellow students, but also um, maybe um, Professor Kunkel can say something about uh, his experience because we are really not sure uh, yeah. what is better there. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe we can talk about this in the end if there's time. And yeah, what you might have learned, um, I think, or for me, this one, the thing with Nama was really, really uh, surprising. I thought like, yeah, eight from eight hours, maybe down to like one and a half hour, but then we were like 10 minutes and this was really cool. Uh, then it was very good that we optimized the sequential code first. I personally wanted to go much earlier to the, to the, um, to the parallel stuff, but Tim said no, first sequential first, and this was good. Um, then the problem side is really, really interesting because, as I said, the parallel approach one um, was for one or two PWMs faster, and we, uh, we were really disappointed that we produced something the sequential worse. Was faster. 
And uh, the sequence was faster, but then when it comes to a bigger data size, then we really earned uh, the fruits that we that we uh, made there. And uh, yeah, many metrics match, uh, matter. Performance was not the biggest problem, but we really had to fight with the memory. Um, so this is also something that we took from here. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, 